Welcome to this web conference on Japan and the European Union shared interests and cooperation. My name is Federica and I will be the moderation for this session. I mean, the timing of this conference is, of course, no coincidence. It basically takes place in a world context which was very conducive to it. There is the uh, of course, the background of the China question, which is unlikely to end anytime soon. There is, of course, the transition in the United States uh, from a chaotic presidency to a tumultuous transition. And all the question it raised about the sustainability of the alliances in Asia, of course, but also in Europe in many ways. There is the transition of power in Japan, the unexpected uh, resignation of uh, Prime Minister Abe and the succession by Mr. Suga. And on the European side, I mean, this is a conference which takes place four years uh, after four years of uh, very painful negotiation on Brexit. In other words, four years during which Europe was very self-absorbed and maybe not paying as much attention as it could have or should have to the rest of the world in a context which was, in any case, extremely difficult. And finally, and this is, in a way, almost a contradiction to what I just said, this is also a conference which is taking place when Europe is starting to rethink its relation with Asia in general and, and the Indo-Pacific in particular, or the other way around. I mean, uh, ideas which were almost taboos just a year ago are now becoming, if not fashionable, at least debated, especially after the publication by Germany and Netherlands of their own guidelines uh, for the Indo-Pacific region. And two years after France itself had decided that it would have and had published and had made very public its Indo-Pacific strategy. So the way, uh, this signal in a way, not just a, a change of attitude vis-a-vis -vis the region, it did signal a new way of looking at China per se. It also, in a more subtle way, probably did signal a new positioning vis-a-vis -vis the United States. How Japan looks at Europe in this context is of particular interest to all of us. And I'm sure that uh, our two speakers today will do a great job in enlightening us about this Japanese position. We have two eminent speakers, which I'm delighted to welcome this morning, and which I will introduce now. Dr. Atsuko Igashino, who is Associate Professor in the Faculty of International Studies at the University of Tsukuba. Good morning, Professor Igashino. Uh, she's an expert on uh, European politics and policies, and she has had uh, long association with Europe. She was a lecturer at the University of Birmingham uh, before she went back to Japan. She also worked as a special assistant for the Japanese delegation to the OECD in Paris. So she is not just an expert on, she is familiar with Europe and has lived in Europe for a long time. And Dr. Valérie Nike, who most of you know, is head of the Asia Department at the Foundation for Strategic Research in Paris. She's also a joint senior fellow at the Japan Institute for International Affairs and a lecturer at KU University in Tokyo on Sino-Japanese relations. She has published extensively on Asian issue and Japan in particular, and I'm sure that both of them will do an excellent job at presenting uh, the topic of today. Each of them will speak for about 15 to 10 minutes, uh, depending. Mr. Dr. Uh, Higashino will speak first, and Dr. Nikkei will comment on this. Uh, and then we'll move to the Q&A session. You all have uh, on your screen a Q&A button. Please use this to transmit your question to us and I will relay them to the speakers when we start the Q&A. I'll remind that before we start the Q&A. And for the time being, let's get immediately into the discussion. Dr. Igashino, you do have the mic for 15 minutes. Thank you, thank you, Frederick. So, um, merci beaucoup, bonjour. Uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Um, today, I'm hoping to share my thoughts with the audience kindly gathered for this occasion concerning some major issues on EU-Japan or more generally EU-Asia relationship. So, I'd like to start my talk with the EU-China Comprehensive Investment Agreement, CAI, that has two basic agreements at the very end of last year, as this attracts significant interest here in Japan as well. 
Uh, but that said, I'm not speaking much about the details of Kai per se, but rather I'd like to focus more on the reaction from Japan concerning disagreement and what we can see as Japanese attitude towards the EU in general. When I speak of Japanese reaction to the Kai, I'm speaking more about that of wider public and that of media. I'm doing this partly because the Japanese government so far is not making any sort of official statement concerning this Kai, whether they welcome it or dislike it or whatsoever. So they're actually keeping very quiet about it so as often as it's often the case. So the main reaction came from the newspapers and analysis. I think all these responses uncover deep-rooted expectation from the side of Japan vis-a-vis -vis Europe, being a sort of guardian of human rights, sustainability, and essential norms, as well as being sort of hard-nosed actor towards China. And my argument in this occasion is that this very strong and specific expectation towards the EU concerning its attitudes vis-a-vis -vis China does reflect the fact that Japan tends to expect Europe to be a hard norm guardian concerning human rights, forced labor, climate change. Norms, they, those are norms that Japan has, well, very little intention whatsoever to demand to China by Japan itself or even directly. So I personally am very pessimistic about this characteristic of Japan's attitude to Europe, in that it hopes Europe to be very strict to China on their behalf. So that Japan needs to put more direct pressure to China concerning human rights and other original norms that Japan claims to share with Europe. So let me begin with how the Kai was um, suddenly jumped up to the headline of Japanese newspapers at the end of last year. The majority of Japanese were informed that the EU kind of gave up that Kai to come into agreement by the end of December 2020. And we also knew that the Netherlands, Poland, and even France expressed negative views for the rapid conclusion of this agreement. But all of a sudden, the news that reports that the EU was actually trying to, uh, its best to have a deal with China by the very end of the year came in. I myself must confess that myself, who has been following the EU affairs for the past 30 years, were quite surprised to see that European people work so intensively after Christmas. And this timing also uh, inevitably gave the impression to Japanese um, wider audiences that the EU was much more serious than this deal than most Japanese people had expected. So just as I said, this come, came as rather as a shock because in 2020, we Japanese have seen quite a few negative developments of EU-China relationship in general because of the disappointment toward China, be it it's mask diplomacy at the very early stage of the COVID-19 crisis, the euphoria diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis France or Czech Republic or many other EU member states, or potential vaccine diplomacy, which seems to be going on right now. The general understanding here in Japan was that EU's attitude has visibly been hardened towards China. Therefore, the basic agreement of the CAI, even though it is a very, very basic one that actually needed to have more time to finalize, was all the more surprising, even shocking. So I myself have been following the development of the framework also of the 16 plus one or 70 plus one, as well as the relationship between the BRI and Europe for the past few years. And I've been writing elsewhere in the considerable frequency that the level of satisfaction of the Central and Eastern European countries towards, the, towards their privileged relationship with China has visibly been degraded for the past few years. I mean, many Central and Eastern European countries were pretty eager to attract interest and investment from China around the year, let's say, 
2016 and 2017, but after that, in, and in particular in the year 2019 and 2020, we thought that we are observing a visible waning of such expectation by the Central and Eastern European countries towards China. Of course, 70 plus one had nothing to do with the EU itself, but I thought that, and many Europe watcher in Japan also thought that the investment agreement was highly unlikely when many of the EU's members who used to be very passionate about building relationship with China are slowly turning their back to China. So another issue was the lack of background information or knowledge concerning the CHI itself. Because the CHI wasn't a topic in Japan, uh, uh, CHI wasn't a topic which has been covered by Japanese media very frequently before. So many people in Japan didn't necessarily know that what it is all about, or it has been negotiated between e the EU and Japan since 2014. And the end of the year 2020 was a target date for the, wrapping it up. So they knew very little about it, actually. So we Japanese were surprised and reacted somehow negatively about this investment agreement. So here I'd like to show you some of the responses from major newspapers and TV stations concerning this CAI. So let me um, share my screen. So could you just wait for a moment? Do you see the screen? Yes. Yes, you do? Okay, thank you. So let me start with Asahi. Um, it says that the EU is prioritizing economy to human rights by having this CAI. This is indeed a point that I'd like to make problematic in my talk today because this signifies a larger wide strip psychology that we Japanese tend to have to, your, to Europeans that we cannot do uh, by ourselves. I really have to say that Japan has exactly prioritized the economy to human rights much more than you do, you Europeans do. So um, uh, when the RCEP reached agreements last year, for example, no one actually problematized this from the viewpoint of human rights, etc. So ironically, therefore, Japan is accusing itself when criticizing EU for this point. So it actually has a kind of booming effect vis-a-vis -vis Japan, so to speak. So as it is, and it is this sort of lack of self-reflection that I always wish to prioritize when it's come to Japanese attitudes concerning Europe or Euro-China relationships. So let's just move on. Let's have a look at the, oops. Uh, TV Asahi. Um, it says it's a diplomatic victory of China to have this sky. Here, I think, again, is the example of tech, uh, typical Japanese response to the CAI. And again, this sort of win or lose sort of argument, which tends to be quite simplistic, was widely seen as a response um, uh, at, the, at the time of RCEP-related argument as well. For example, it is the, uh, if it is a diplomatic victory of China, since it is inevitably going to China-led initiative, or some say that it is a diplomatic defeat when it's come to RCEP uh, in terms of Japan, as it's able to bring India in the uh, framework. So very similar sort of argument is used to analyze the CAI uh, uh, with the uh, anal uh, analysis of RCEP as well. So, uh, in any case, this is the quite a few very interesting parallels in the argument concerning the CAI and the RCEP. And also, let's have a look at the editorial by Nikkei. It says that it is a destructive influence for EU US relationship at the dawn of Biden administration. So this is the, another typical example of the actions from Japan. And it is the uh, something that caused by 
uh, and set by Xi Jinping, uh, rather than you know, uh, ad admitting the uh, certain sort of initiative from the side of the EU. So this is the uh, very um, typical um, kind of response from uh, Japanese media. Okay. And also the uh, similar argument goes uh, in at Sankei Shimbun as well. I will stop sharing about this screen and Okay. So here you have seen several typical response from the side of Japan and as you can see there were more negative responses from positive, than positive responses and what was even more interesting was that within a few days of this basic agreement between Merkel, Macron and Xi Jinping we have seen pretty massive criticism within the EU about this agreement. So in the end, we Japanese were indeed initially surprised by the Kai and some had a kind of distrust like feeling, saying that, look, how can Europe be criticized in Xinjiang and Hong Kong and at the same time preparing this sort of economic agreement with China? But later it came uh, came to the understanding that the, uh, this came also as a big surprise for ordinary Europeans and and some Europeans are much more angry than we are. So the evaluation of Sky from Japan indeed experienced a drastic sort of roller coaster like ups and downs. It, to generalize this sort of ups and downs, it is something like that, well, we were really surprised and presently, uh, but if Europeans are as unhappily supplied just as we are, then it's sort of acceptable. So if you allow me to be very sarcastic, many Japanese people initially wondered whether the EU shares the same amount of concern vis-a-vis -vis China, whether the EU shares the same value with uh, Japan, but, uh, but later by looking at the uh, European responses, the Kai made them assured that, okay, Europe is as worried about China just as we are. So whether this is healthy, our ideal reaction or not, is another question indeed. And that brings us to another important topic. So now that the EU has an agreement in principle of the Kai, and now that Japan has RCEP with China, how could the EU and Japan work effectively and meaningfully with each other in order to deal together with the challenges posed by China? So I was listening to the webinar organized by the Belgian think tank SEPS probably last week, and there Zabine Weyand mentioned that it will only be finalized around the end of this year, and then the European Parliament need to ratify it. So I am aware that it still needs time. So, but just because that things are still in the forming process, this year 2021 may be a crucial year to prepare for a common stance or common red lines, if you like, towards China, if it is possible to do it at all. It all up to the political will of both sides, and in my view, Japan needs to reflect and reshape its existing policy towards China, uh, and how it could be redirected so that any meaningful cooperation with the EU is possible. So for me, it looks like Japan has more to think of, of about not think about it than the EU does in this regard. So um, I'm coming to the end of my talk. So is there anything that I can propose today? So of course, one of the most obvious elements is the EPA, SPA between the EU and Japan. Those have been and definitely going to be the, the most important framework for the further cooperation between the two. So there's no question about it. So is there anything else to top up to that? Uh, it may be rather indirect way that one thing, but uh, one thing that I am wishing to consider with you audiences here is that how could we use Japan-EU connectivity in a better and more effective way? 
From the outset, the EU and Japan had China in mind when forming disconnected strategy together. It was signed in September 2019, I believe. So more than one year passed. It still needed to be known in the first place to the target, targeted regions, be it the Western Balkan countries or Eastern European countries or African countries. And um, I've actually been asking my colleagues in the Western Balkan countries and Eastern European countries about how they wish this Japan EU connectivity to benefit their own region. And quite frequently, I was disappointed to see that this framework has won the recognition within the region. So in the first place, it should be known more to the region. And by achieving sustainability and rule-based principles, and by building up such ex uh, experiences in the course of the time, the way that the EU and Japan work more in the same way thanks to China would gradually be formed from various sort of directions. So um, sorry to pass the, uh, uh, my limited time. So many thanks. I'm looking very much forward to asking, uh, having a question and listening to the different views at the Q&A session. And uh, among other things, I'm looking very much forward to listening to uh, Professor Nikkei. Thank you. Thanks for listening. So let's jump immediately to the question, to the, uh, the intervention of Dr. Nikkei. Valérie, you do have the floor for 10 minutes. Okay, thank you, Frédéric, and uh, thank you, Atsuka, Atsuko, for your presentation. And uh, yes, Kai is a very major issue, and it has been very much discussed uh, here in uh, Europe, not only among the experts on China, who almost universally has been uh, rather opposed to the signature of that uh, Kai agreement, mostly for one reason. Of course, there is a content which is considered to be rather limited and not giving enough guarantees to even to uh, European investors to, for doing good business in, uh, in uh, China, but also uh, because that the timing of the CHI was considered to be extremely negative uh, before the uh, nomination of the, uh, the election of, uh, I mean, the installation of uh, Joe Biden. And uh, this is exactly, I mean, for China, Kai as RECIP, and I will come back maybe very briefly to RECIP a little bit later. This is completely related to strategic gains and absolutely not to economic interest. Of course, there is the economic side of it, but basically, uh, China didn't care about concessions except on vital issues for the Chinese regime, like labor laws and, uh, the, you know, ratifying the um, uh, international organization on labor, for instance, they refused to do it. They said they would consider, but they didn't make any real promise, but for China it was a strategic gain to obtain from the EU on one side, but also from Japan and other countries in East Asia at the same time, a little bit before, a, a piece of paper to be able to show to the United States that in spite of, of COVID-19, in spite of what happened in Hong Kong, in spite of the dis, dis, disastrous situation of human rights in China recently, China still was so an important partner to both Japan on one side and other countries and to Europe on the other side that it could get absolutely what it wanted to get. Whatever the reality, I mean, for China, the most important issue about CHI or about RECIP was to, to look like being accepted by both the EU on one side and uh, Asian countries and Japan on the other. It was part of the strategy that China consistently is trying to build of division, division between European countries, of course, but also division between the US and their closest allies. Just to come back very briefly, I will just give a, a few points because time is brief. Uh, you mentioned, of course, uh, I think there were very positive uh, evolutions in Europe regarding China, regarding the Indo-Pacific and regarding relations with Japan. You mentioned 
the strategic partnership, which is of course extremely important, even though the number of areas of co cooperation uh, in security can lead to some inter, uh, questions uh, about what what is a reality, but what is a reality, concrete cooperation beyond that, uh, that huge number of the field of potential cooperation between Japan and the EU. Um, and there are a few points that I would like to raise, um, a few challenges to these relations between the EU and Japan. What first, the first one is Trump, in a way, like China, was a great unifier uh, for the EU and Japan to work together and try to find a way not to be too dependent on the US. Of course, the US is extremely important for Japan in terms of security, the way the EU cannot be absolutely not on even uh, EU member states. But still, uh, there was a wariness regarding the US that led Japan and the EU to share some concerns. So now the question, what will happen with the new president, Joe Biden? Uh, do we share the same objectives regarding the United States on all relations with the United States? And will it favor or limit the scope of the EU-Japan strategic partnership with a new president in the US who claims to be more eager to rebuild trust and relationship with its uh, traditional allies. But you see that in Europe, some of the member states are thinking about the concept of Europe puissance, whatever it means. Others are much more reluctant. And I am not sure that Japan has yet find, found its position regarding that concept. Um, and at the same time, as you mentioned, one thing that Japan shares with the EU on at some countries in the EU, I see, I'm thinking about Germany, for instance, but not only, is an ambiguity regarding its relations with China. For the EU, China is a destabilizing actor, potentially a threat in a way, a, system, a systemic river, re, rival, but at the same time, this is a major economic partner. And the same, of course, is true for Japan, and much more so maybe recently than one year, two years ago. EU, as you said, signed the CHI, but Japan accepted the receipt, both giving China, China, as I mentioned earlier, a strategic gain with the hidden objective of putting pressure on the US to demonstrate their own strategic autonomy in a way. There is also the question of quad. Uh, quad is extremely interesting uh, format, but what about the EU? What uh, about European states? What about ASEAN? I leave that open to discussion. And last but not the, le not, not the least, uh, Japan is, of course, at the core of the concept of free and open Indo-Pacific. In Europe, France has been the first to publish its own Indo-Pacific uh, strategy, in a way. It has been followed much, much more recently by Germany or the Netherlands, but on rather different basis. Basically, Germany is much more reluctant to focus on the China factor. The UK, however, has none, or not yet, and still, uh, living in, in Tokyo right now, it's, it's uh, maybe like a manifestation of kind of Taisho nostalgia, maybe, I don't know, but the UK seems to be perceived by some, at least in Japan, as the major closest strategic partner of Japan in terms of security, to the risk of antagonizing EU partners. Because, as you well know, the values that led to Brexit and to the new global Britain uh, concept are not exactly the ones that constitute the fundamentals for the European Union. So these are three points that I wanted to raise regarding more broadly relations between EU and Japan and just leave it to open to the discussion. Thank you. I will say that, yes, we have a broad set of issues presented for those two, uh, through those two presentations. I mean, clearly, the uh, Japanese concerns over the EU-China comprehensive agreement on investment echoes European concern on the RCEP and uh, the emergence perhaps 
of what could be seen by some at least as a new Asian bloc. I know that Japan is, uh, as well as other uh, countries which have signed the RCEP, is looking at it in a slightly different manner and balance it with the CPTPP, which again opens a set of questions. So, uh, and the RCEP itself has some connection to the agreement on uh, the investment because there is a most favored nation clause on the RCEP regarding the investment. So I would like you, and this is very much the question, a question which has been asked by one of the, uh, by Mr. Uh, Abelsar in the um, in the audience. Uh, how did the how does the EU react to Japan signing the RCEP on the one side? And if I may add a personal touch, um, what would Japan's reaction be if, like uh, the UK? the EU asked to join the CPTPP, which is a question which is likely to emerge in the coming years anyway, in one form or the other. Dr. Higashino, perhaps? Okay, do I answer the question in the first place or, or do you collect the question? Can, can I ask? Okay. I will answer the question in a very short-handed way. Um, thank you very much, Frederick, for your um, uh, comments. And um, I, I totally agree that the uh, just like we've got, um, or, or general Japanese public has got um, uh, concern or some sort of um, unrooted sort of concern to ask Kai. Uh, I do, we do understand that the uh, EU equally has got the uh, uh, concern concerning RCEP. And uh, I, I have, have, we have heard many, many arguments from the side of the European people that the uh, Kai is something to, you know, be, um, sort of um, catch up. I don't really know whether the, uh, you, the the term of catch up is appropriate in this regards or context, but uh, I, I have had so many evaluation from the side of the European people that the uh, RCEP is the, something to, uh, no, sorry, CAI is something to um, catch up to the RCEP, which has been already in place. So, and um, as um, sort of um, someone who, uh, read and um, see all this um, informational analysis of voice from Europe very frequently. Uh, I fully understand uh, what, what is being said, but the, the thing is, uh, this sort of a mutual aspect that they are, just as we have got the um, um, concern with the KAI, European people might have got the uh, um, uh, uh, Concerned vis a vis reset, it's not very well understood in for the Japanese uh, 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 wider audiences. So that sort of a disproportionate, disproportionate sort of information is can be one of the problem. I think. So I hope this is the answer for that. And um, uh, also uh, in terms of the uh, UK, uh, I think Valerie San uh, also raised the question that the how. And Japan and uh, see the UK um, in terms of the uh, even after the time of the Brexit, if Japan is still seeing the U uh, UK uh, as a main partner uh, uh, economically or uh, politically or security wise, I think it is still the case that the uh, Japan still expects a lot to the United Kingdom, even though after the Brexit. Uh, because, uh, of course, there has been a lot of disappointment about what happened during the time of the Brexit process, and it's just too long, and there's a too, so, uh, too many sort of disadvantages that uh, Japanese companies have got from this uh, very confusing process of the um, Brexit. But still, I think uh, the expectation is very high, and it's, uh, uh, the idea of the uh, UK is joining the TPP is always has been uh, receives with a very welcoming tone uh, from the uh, Japanese audiences. So I think uh, you're right that they are, um, uh, even though 
after this very confusing Brexit period, and the still, uh, the, it is very likely that the, uh, this confusion still goes on. I think uh, st still the expectation vis a -vis the UK is very high, and uh, TPP is, um, uh, with, I, I haven't really heard anything negative about the uh, UK joining the TPP from the uh, general sort of newspaper reporting and TV reporting as, as such. So I think there's a, a sort of the disproportionate sort of evaluation in the uh, Japanese uh, audiences in general, even though France is very active in, in uh, Asia Pacific, Germany is trying to do so. I think that is not really well informed and understood. Or, or, and uh, I think the information concerning the UK is also, uh, is on the contrary, very easy to get, very easy to be welcomed. So I think there is still the time lag, if I may put it in this way, concerning how we accept the reality, which is going actually on in not only in Europe, but also in uh, Asia Pacific as well. So I hope I kind of answered the questions. Thank you. My turn to Valerie. Valerie, would you like to comment on the EU reaction vis-a-vis -vis the RCEP? Yes. Um well, basically, I think we had the same kind of, uh, well, I'm, I'm not speaking particularly, I'm not a specialist of Europe, as you know very well, <laughs> and much more of Asia. So uh, in the broader community of experts working on Asia and Japan, I think that we, we, we had the same kind of, I will not say, so, uh, I will not use the word disappointment, but the same kind of questions regarding why, especially as I mentioned before about the timing of that uh, signing of the receipt. Of course, the argument uh, varies in Japan was first that uh, the receipt was basically uh, nothing new. I mean, it was just uh, aggregating together a lot of free trade agreement already existing between at the bilateral level between regions and China. So it's not not such a big deal. I mean, the, the official position was, well, it's not that important. And then another interesting argument that I would buy much more into was that uh, Japan and the fact that uh, Australia, New Zealand also are part of the receipt was a way to kind of like in a kind of go game, the game of go, you know, in Japan to encircle China from the outside. So who wins is not that clear in the mind on the, in the, through the analysis of a lot of experts work, working in Japan on the receipt, for instance. And some do consider the position is, after all, we sign the receipt that China is not alone. I mean, is not leading because you have South, South Korea, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, of course not India. And India, I mean, Japan very much hoped for India to get into the receipt in order to control even better China. So there, there is a kind of double game there. But still, I do believe that both in the case of the receipt and in the case of Kai, what is a, whatever the content, Whatever the limitations, the fact that it's not ratified yet for the CHI, that receipt is not that important, maybe. I think the most important thing is that we played into the game. We played the game that China wanted us to play vis-a-vis -vis the US. I'm not saying that we must absolutely follow the US policy. I mean, gang up, as our president just said, with the US systematically uh, against, against China, and we have our own interest. Uh, and it, it's important for Japan and the EU to discuss together about our interest, in, I mean, even without the US, but the, it will be very difficult now with a new president in the US, maybe, which is much more amenable and uh, easier to deal with for Japan, for instance, and the, the motivation to, to try to 
to build a stronger dialogue between uh, allies, partners, like-minded countries, but building a kind of independent thinking on some issues. Uh, uh, I mean, of course, close allies of the US, but still with our own interests might be more difficult now than before. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, please. Please be quiet. Yeah, please, uh, sorry, because um, I just missed the point that uh, you, Frederick, uh, mentioned that the very important thing that about the possibility of expanding or shrinking leadership at, at the time of Biden era. So I, I meant to mention about it, but I didn't do this. So, so I just, I was just hoping to coming back to the, that issue as well. So um, whether um, Biden and this patient may uh, foster the uh, relationship between uh, the uh, EU, Japan, China, uh, EU, Japan, and the United States is, a, uh, I think, indeed a big question. And uh, w uh, I would like to focus whether that Biden administration would, uh, in the end, um, push the uh, EU and Japan cooperation in general. So I've got the very mixed um, evaluation about it. But all in all, I think. Um, I think EU and Japan relationship has got a, 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 a sort of autonomous sort of uh, momentum by now. So regardless of uh, the uh, uh, Biden administration or the whole Trump administration, I think it will go on because they are, I think we are good enough for cutting up um, cutting aside the uh, different issues and uh, most related issues together. And uh, uh, it is, uh, I think the, uh, what EU, the EU and Japan has to do together, it's relatively clear at the moment. So I think Biden administration would have a um, little effect concerning the uh, uh, promotion of the EU-Japan relationship. So I was just wondering what, what the uh, uh, Valerie Sensei would think about this. I think uh, we, I dealt already with uh, relationship with the Biden administration. Maybe uh, we, I don't know if there are any questions anymore. No, no, there are questions that uh, I would like to let you comment on this. Uh, we do have a question regarding for you, Dr. Uh, Higashino, sorry, uh, asking, would you mind developing the idea of a potential fracture between the EU and Japan regarding UK security involvement in the Indo-Pacific? I think that's a very difficult question and uh, uh, whether the, uh, it's going to fracture. Yes, some may find it, it is more important for Japan to cooperate with the uh, UK because it has got, um, uh, uh, because of the, uh, m most of the um, um, technical, uh, kind of cooperation between the UK and Japan, but uh, I myself wouldn't really think it that way because uh, I, I think again, um, Japan and other countries of the European Union, uh, so, sorry, the, uh, the, uh, the existing member countries of the European Union, like France, Germany, or even Central Eastern countries, has got in the, on, the, on the track about the uh, how to move on to the uh, cooperation very concretely. So um, personally, I wouldn't see any sort of fluctuation per se uh, by having a UK as a, in, uh, a Asia Pacific actor. Okay. Uh, and now a question to you, Valerie, I mean, from Mr. Michiko Tsuroka in Japan, uh, we say that, yes, he does agree that uh, uh, Japan still sees the UK as its closest European partner, but what do you think the France should do, for example, or could do, to change perception in Japan? Uh, that France emphasized the importance of anti-submarine warfare exercise last December, which is not exactly true because there was very little information in France about that. Uh, that, that exercise indeed involved Japan, France, and the US was great. So would you like to comment? 
Yes, a very brief uh, comment. Actually, uh, France is doing a lot in the Indo-Pacific. As I mentioned earlier, we were the first in Europe to publish the different, uh, it has been translated, Michi, uh, to Kassan. I mean, you can read it in English, the uh, difference of Indo-Pacific has been uh, very recently translated into English. And uh, so, as you know, France is an Indo-Pacific power, uh, like it or not. I mean, uh, and, uh, we have a lot of direct interest, security and sovereignty interest, and we are confronting uh, the role of China increasing, destabilizing role of China in the Pacific, for instance, and in the Indian Ocean uh, quite regularly. And of course, you remember that our uh, Minister of Defense at the time, and it has been repeated every year until the COVID-19, uh, France has been the one to propose to uh, other European countries and to regularly uh, be there in the South China Sea in a very active manner. And we have a co close cooperation with, we have an AXA deal with uh, Japan. We have close cooperation with Japan. I think that exercises will again happen with Japan this spring, uh, even before the UK aircraft carrier should come uh, to this uh, region. And uh, actually one of the things that maybe is lacking with France is a problem of communication. I mean, we should maybe we should do more briefing about what we do uh, regularly to the press. I have a very, I mean, a journalist friend uh, from a very important newspaper here in Japan who told me, but you know, if uh, the French embassy were doing uh, brief lunches for journalists about what you do, I mean, we would go very eagerly, much more than, uh, much more eagerly than to the UK embassy, which is regularly organizing these lunch briefings for journalists. So I think that we also must learn to communicate maybe a little bit better about what we do, not only us, but of course also uh, the EU, because the EU doesn't have the same security role of, but as member states may have. Um, when I say member states, essentially this is France when you speak of EU, but uh, EU is also doing a lot. Uh, and as you mentioned, uh, at SUCO, the uh, public, not only the public, but including in some circles in the Japanese administration are not always aware because the weight of the US desk uh, UK, I mean, Anglo-Saxon, <laughs> just so to, to speak, uh, desk uh, uh, in the Japanese uh, administration is also still very strong. Thank you, Marie. I mean, building up on this, we have a, a question which is partly the same, but which is uh, also enlarging the discussion, which is uh, from Mrs. Shal. And uh, this is a question for you, Dr. Rigashino, is how does Japan perceive the uh, new Indo-Pacific strategies of France, Germany, and the Netherlands. Uh, do they perceive them to start with? Uh, do they see it in the same way? I mean, could we, could you give us a sense of how this move from European member states is, per, is seen in, in Japan? Well, um, I have to say that um, I'm not an expert of the, uh, uh, this field. So um, just um, I, 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 what I can do is to, is just I can give you the, my impression about it. So, so um, as for the general perception concerning the uh, um, um, involvement of the Netherlands and France, uh, Germany, uh, I think it, uh, it, it has been um, taken Positively, but uh, everything is related to what uh, Valerie said uh, previously. That there are ve just very, very um, limited sort of information concerning the uh, actual activities which is going on in Indo-Pacific strategy, um, because so it, it has not been really covered by the uh, papers and analysis, and uh, most people doesn't really uh, uh, dare to look at it. So uh, I think uh, just as Valerie said. Um, the very regular sort of um, 
um, information sessions and uh, uh, dissemination act uh, activity is absolutely needed. But in general, we have no reason whatsoever to uh, find it negative about these countries' involvement, like France and Germany and the Netherlands, because it is uh, always very important to diversify the actors of the uh, uh, what is happening in the Indo-Pacific regions. And it is, um, uh, as you can see, this is the uh, still very ongoing and uh, in the process of shaping about the uh, basic structures and geopolitics, what is going on in, in the Pacific regions. So um, I think uh, generally Japanese would think that it is always very welcome to have a several or plural European powers or countries getting into uh, these regions. So I hope this partly answer the question. Uh, I still, still to you, Dr. Rikesh, you know, um, I always, the, the, the European debate on uh, EU strategic autonomy perceived and understood in, uh, in Japan, and is, and this is a different question, but nevertheless a linked one, is the Indo-Pacific debate, which is emerging now in Europe, be seen, seen as part of this debate on EU strategic autonomy. So could you repeat that question? Your, your voice is kind of uh, broken. I know, I know, I know. So there is nothing I can do about the technique. So uh, uh, the question is, was there any comment in Japan on the debate in Europe on EU strategic autonomy? And I'll ask the second part of the question later. Yeah, okay. Um, about the EU strategic autonomy, yes, it, uh, it is uh, very much covered in uh, Japan as well. And uh, I, I think um, uh, and, uh, many people might uh, wish to interpret this as a, a kind of a byproduct of uh, Trump's administration that they, since Trump's administration is that's um, very uncertain and fluctuated, I think uh, Europe, uh, it, it's somehow got the uh, uh, positive effect vis-a-vis -vis Europe, that the Europe really coming to the very serious consideration about its uh, strategic autonomy. In. And uh, I think, um, well, even though uh, the uh, transatlantic relationship uh, at the time of uh, Trump era has been very problematic and very confusing, I think th that's uh, the one positive effect that uh, uh, Japan, uh, uh, Europe come to the uh, uh, very concrete sort of uh, uh, strategic autonomy. So I think this is uh, again relatively well understood and uh, well received in Japan as well. I hope I, I can I an answer to your question. Okay, uh, let, let's ask the second part of the question, which uh, uh, is the debate in emerging debate in Europe about Indo-Pacific is seen as part of this debate on the EU strategic autonomy, or do you see it as two totally different questions? Mm, in Japan, I think it is understood in a very sep uh, as a separate issue. So that may be the part of the question because uh, we don't really generalize the uh, links between the uh, two. So, um, as far, uh, but uh, I, I, we can clearly see that for the, from the European perspective, it is the uh, kind of uh, getting to be a seamless uh, issue for your side. So uh, I think uh, I would say that one of the question or one of the problem is that uh, we Japanese tend to see it's a very, very different one. Okay. Thank you very much. Valérie, you live in Japan, so perhaps you could give us also your sense of the Japanese reaction to the same question. Well, uh, very briefly, no, I, actually I wanted to just to add a few points. Uh, first, uh, about strategic autonomy. Uh, yes, this is a subject of interest in Japan, uh, who, where some analysts are wondering about uh, what does that mean exactly. And it is often interestingly related, and I mean quite obviously related to, uh, to France, of course, and to uh, all position regarding NATO and the future role of NATO. And what is also very interesting is that uh, when people speak about, some people speak about Quad, the role of the UK, uh, Indo-Pacific, differences with the EU, 
very often comes this curious idea of uh, Asia or global NATO, where the UK would be like a kind of bridge between the Western part on the Indo-Pacific or Japan part. Of course, this is all in the realm of fantasy and you know, discussing different formats. But I think it is interesting that in Japan, some, uh, quite a few are just wondering what kind of relations, who is in charge of security, who is in charge of defense, who is in charge of, sec you know, um, in, in Europe. And so, and you have the same debate in Europe, of course, between countries like France or Germany. And the other, I mean, another question which has never, which is not clarified at the level of the EU is that at least, I mean, the EU has changed a lot regarding the Indo-Pacific and the role of China, and especially last year and the year before. But still, some countries obviously are extremely reluctant to put a name to what we have to prepare against in the region. Even though every, everyone knows that China is a big elephant in the room and we have to, I mean, the focus of, of our strategic interest in the region is China much more than other threats. Uh, but still, just to say it is difficult. And it's the same in Japan, and especially uh, since uh, I mean, I will not, uh, I mean, more recently, obviously, some people in Japan also do think that China is, above all, a very important uh, economic partner, especially in the context of COVID-19 and economic recovery. And um, so naming is extremely difficult. So as long as we will not share inside the EU, among member states, and with Japan itself, uh, the same willingness to name the reality, I think uh, sometimes it might be difficult to really build something, leaving too, me too many things not clearly mentioned. This is not how you build a, a, a real partnership, solid for the future and dealing with real issues. Thank you very much, Valérie. It's unfortunately time to bring this session to a close. So I will thank you both, uh, Dr. Gashino. Thank you, Valérie, for your intervention. Thank you, the audience, for your question. I know that we haven't had the time to take all of them, but nevertheless, I think it made for a good discussion. So thank you all, uh, and uh, have a good day, and see you soon for another, another web conference. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.